You know, I've walked with Jesus for 44 years, seeking to follow him as he led me throughout those 44 years. And yet, there have been days when I would have hesitated to call myself devoted. I suspect that some of you know what I mean. How many of us who know and love Jesus also sometimes struggle with feelings of spiritual emptiness amidst the busyness of life? How many of us sometimes know what it feels like to be running on fumes, to not have much to go on? Or you routinely feel hindered by disappointments in yourself as you wonder, how did I manage to blow it again, yet again? And does that leave you feeling like God may be frowning at you rather than smiling at you with that furrowed brow. Do you ever feel that way? In 44 years, I've had opportunity to feel that way quite a number of times. Part of the reason I hesitate to describe myself as devoted at times is how easily I can get distracted. I'm very easily distracted. In fact, did you know that experts say that over 366 million adults in the world that they know of have ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And that said, ADHD is much less likely to be picked up in adults than in children because adults don't spend as much time around people who may pick up on the symptoms the way maybe a school teacher would for children. Most adults who are diagnosed with ADHD probably also don't have the hyperactive symptoms that they may have had as a child, but they still have the inattention. There's two different subtypes to ADHD. One is ADHD-I, which stands for inattentive, and one is ADHD-H, which stands for, stands for hyperactive. And some have a little of both, a bit of a combination. I have a good reason to believe that I have ADHD of the inattentive type. And my wife, Fiona, will heartily agree with that. When I see all the primary symptoms listed of ADHD, and I've checked more than one list, and they say if you have five of these, you're likely to have ADHD, without exception, I always have almost all of the symptoms, almost all of the time. It's, it's who I am. Yeah, the, the illustration of a dog being distracted by a squirrel, that consistently applies to me. In fact, the other day I was visiting with somebody um, at a nursing home. I was just visiting with this elderly guy. He lives on the ground floor with a nice window out to a, some, some space where there's some trees and bushes. And, and all of a sudden in the middle of the visit, I literally said, hey, Look, there's a squirrel. I was distracted by a squirrel, just like they say. And though I'm known to be a devoted reader of books, which you'd think requires some attention, I am a reader of books. I read, I'll read up to 20, 25 books a year, nonfiction books, not novels, but like technical stuff, theological stuff. What people don't know is I can hardly read for longer than 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes even as little as five minutes, without getting distracted and having to put the book down until I come back and pick it up again and read it a little later. I get distracted after five minutes of reading, after two pages of reading, after three pages. Meanwhile, Fiona, who's a reader, can read for hours on end without getting distracted. I don't understand that. And the reason I often end up reading three or four books at the same time, right now I'm reading four books at the same time, not, not literally at the same time, but four books are ongoing, is because I get distracted by books while I'm reading books. And I want to start a new one. And if I devote myself to a routine, if I really devote myself to getting into a routine, doing something every day, it's a real accomplishment for me if I do it more than two days in a row. I'm serious. 
If I try to exercise, if I exercise three days in a row, ho, oh, whoa, I deserve a prize. That's just because I get distracted. I'm giving you a glimpse into my life. So how many of you can relate to my struggle of remaining devoted to something when we can so easily be distracted or when we can so easily be discouraged? And I'm both. I am easily discouraged and easily distracted. For 44 years I've been like that. Today we're going to take a look at a passage in Acts that summarizes the main characteristics of the early church. We've seen how God the Holy Spirit filled those first disciples of Jesus. And then we saw last week a beautiful Christ-centered sermon that one of those disciples named Peter preached uh, on the day of Pentecost. And he declared Jesus to be God. And he made it clear that Jesus wants to fill us all with his spirit so that we're all empowered to share Jesus with others. Perhaps some of you this week were able to share a testimony with somebody about how God has impacted your life. And Luke, the writer of the Adventures of Acts, as we've been calling it, described the early church as devoted. Devoted. That word that I have trouble with. That's how he described them. And it reminded me of my struggle to remain devoted. But it also encouraged me by the way Luke emphasized devotion in the early church. So let's take a look at that passage. Acts chapter 2. It's on your handout or if you have your Bibles with you. You can open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Verses 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. There's that word devoted. But it doesn't just apply to the apostles' teaching. He applies it to several other things as well. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. That word devoted, as in they devoted themselves, is a very important word. He applied it, as I mentioned, to all four of those areas of the early church that he emphasizes. And when we hear that word devoted, it should cause us to ask ourselves some questions. When you hear the word devoted, perhaps it, it... prompts you to ask, what am I devoted to? What does being devoted look like in my life, depending on what I'm devoted to? Am I devoted to what I see the first followers of Jesus being devoted to? Or is what I'm devoted to distracting me from what the first followers of Jesus were devoted to? Luke uses this word six times in the whole book of Acts. So, It was obviously a word that was important to him. It means to hold fast, to persevere in, to fervently continue in something. Squirrel! Oh, sorry. You see what I mean? It's easy to get distracted when you're seeking to be devoted. As I've mentioned, I struggle to hold fast, to persevere, to maintain fervency in something. Now, of course, I'm capable of devotion. I think all of us here could say that of ourselves. I have held fast. I have persevered. I've I've remained a follower of Jesus for 44 years. I've also clung to Jesus through long-lasting trials, like my wife's kidney failure, which lasted for, for over 20 years, getting worse and worse. I persevered through that. 
I've persevered through a food bank. We, we started a food bank in 1992 as a church. Fiona and I launched that. It's still going. We're still helping to keep that thing running. It's the long, aside from big organizations like Solo Mission and UGM, it is the longest running food bank in the city of Winnipeg. We've persevered. So of course I know what it's like to hold fast and to persevere. But such examples are the grace of God at work in me, not Ken Peters. But of course, that's Luke's point. Luke's point is that this is all about Jesus and not about the first disciples, not about us. Every one of the four things that Luke mentioned that the first followers of Jesus were devoted to were only possible because the Holy Spirit had filled them as the helper that Jesus promised them. But not only that, the four things that Luke mentioned about the first followers of Jesus, the things they were devoted to, were also all corporate in nature. Corporate, meaning that Luke understood the Christian life as being lived together. I'd have given up all hope of running a food bank for 32 years if it had just been up to Fiona and me to run it. If we'd done it completely alone, it never would have lasted. It lasted because it was a team. We have kept the food bank running. It's been corporate in nature. In fact, I'd have lost hope regarding Fiona's kidney failure as well. If I hadn't had people in my life supporting me, sharing my burdens, praying for me, coming alongside me and encouraging me and encouraging Fiona, we wouldn't have made it without others. And Luke understood that as he described the Christian life as being lived together with others. Luke used that word repeatedly, that idea of togetherness. Luke mentioned that Jesus' followers devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. All of those things point to a togetherness. They can't be done alone. They're meant to be done together. Yes, we need God's help. Certainly we need God's help. But God often helps us through others. We need each other. We need one another in the body of Christ. Let's just say that sometimes the Holy Spirit in us is not in us so that we can live the Christian life. He's in us so that we can help others to live the Christian life. What a wonder. I've never thought of that before. Am I filled with the Spirit just to help me? Or am I filled with the Spirit to help me help you? And you're filled with the Spirit to help you help me. Come on. That's called living together. Let's just pause here and consider what gets in the way of remaining devoted to receiving God's teaching, fellowship with other Christians, corporate remembrance of Christ's sacrifice, corporate prayers. What gets in the way? What comes to mind? Well, our careers might come to mind. The fact that we have very, very, very busy jobs. Or maybe entertainment comes to mind. Entertainment can be a distraction. Or maybe family responsibilities come to mind. People with young families, that's, that's a challenge. That's, that's, that is a genuine and legitimate challenge. Or maybe Instagram comes to mind. Social media can get in the way of remaining devoted followers of Jesus. Come on, let's get real. I'm going to share something personal, okay? I shared in a sermon this past New Year's Eve that this past November, I took a week to seek God. I took a week away. I went to a remote location. I spent time alone for a whole five or between five and six days alone with the Lord. And as I did so, I felt God urging me during that time alone, based on things I read and things he shared with me from his word, as I was spending time in his word during that week, that the Lord urged me to spend a more generous amount of time with him each day. 
and to add that time with him to my schedule, to actually write him into my day timer so that things couldn't, other things couldn't crowd out God. And I would keep that appointment with the Lord each day. So my time with God now appears in my calendar as devotional time with God. Okay? Sounds really spiritual, doesn't it? Well, sounds, sounds wonderful. Well, let me walk in the light with you. In the 79 days, which is about 11 plus weeks, since that week away seeking after God, after dedicating myself to spend a generous amount of time with God each day and to not allow other things to crowd out my time with God, I've counted how many days I missed. Do I tell you? Let's just say it was more than just a few days missed. Let's just say it was a fairly surprising number when I looked back at how many days I had missed because I was too busy. I was too distracted. I was too tired. I was too lazy. Or sometimes even too discouraged. Can you imagine that? Too discouraged to spend time with a loving God. But let me tell you something. I feel free to tell you that because when I read this passage we just read, I see Christians who walked together to express their devotion and I'm sure they helped each other to grow in their devotion and I need your help. About a month after that time away with God, Kurt Pei walked up to me and very gently and very kindly said, How's your devotional time going with the Lord? Because he knew of the commitment that I'd made. And I appreciated you asking that. I did. You can ask me again. I had a really good devotional time recently. Very good. Yesterday was phenomenal. Yes. Let's look ahead to a book in the Bible. There's a book in the Bible that was written by a guy named Paul. This was after the church had started expanding to different cities, sometime after the passage we just read. And Paul writes this, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Look at that. Members of the household of God. Let's not miss that. That's talking about relationship. That's talking about a household. It's talking about family. A household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a temple in the Lord. The church grows in the midst of its members being joined together relationally. It's not talking about us each growing in our little prayer closet down on our knees alone with God. Yes, that's important. We need that. We, we don't want to neglect that. But we're not meant to neglect this either. Being together. I don't believe a Christian can grow properly, according to this passage, without the help of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what was happening in the early church, as Luke emphasized this idea of togetherness again and again and again. Think of a struggle you have. Come on, you've all got struggles. Think of a struggle that you have that's hindering you in your devotion to Jesus. Just think of it. Don't I don't want you to shout it out. Just remember what is hindering you. Wouldn't it be helpful if you had someone in your life who was helping you to overcome that struggle so that you didn't have to deal with it alone? Wouldn't it be helpful if you had help? That's what the body of Christ is meant to be. Paul then wrote in another book, brothers and sisters, again, he's using these family words, family words, like brothers and sisters. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live in the spirit or by the spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. And in this in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And of course, that law of Christ is love one another. That was the law of Christ. 
that he shared with us. That language of brothers and sisters speaks of family helping family out of love for one another. What kind of family member would I be if I noticed one of my kids or my spouse or a sibling struggling and I just ignored it? What kind of family member would I be if I saw a brother or sister struggling and I didn't offer to help? All I'm saying here is that devotion to Jesus is meant to be accomplished together with others. It's not meant to be accomplished alone. Luke doesn't just describe devotion here. He describes devotion in the context of community. And any one of you in this room, and I'm going to say this genuinely from my heart, any one of you in this room, nobody is excluded, is welcome to ask me any time, how's your devotional life going with God? I welcome it. How are we going to grow without helping one another grow? We're in this together. That's what Luke was emphasizing as he talked about devotion. But then he talked about four corporate ways that devotion is expressed as we grow together. I'm going to look at each one of those four ways, but we don't have time to explore them in detail. That would be impossible in one short sermon. We could have four sermons, one on each of these areas of devotion But let's just make some brief comments about each one. By considering Peter's sermon that we looked at last week, we can see that the apostles followed the same model of teaching that Jesus used, which is to refer to Moses and all the prophets and what they say about the Christ. Jesus explained that to them after his resurrection. He explained that throughout the entire Bible that they had at that time, the Hebrew scriptures, it was all pointing to Jesus. For later generations, that became what we call the Old Testament. And then the apostles' teaching, the teaching of the apostles that we see in this book, became the New Testament. That's what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, there's a viewpoint circulating these days. I don't know if you've been exposed to it. A viewpoint circulating these days by some fairly well-known, in fact, one very famous Bible teacher, that the Old Testament is not only no longer needed, but that it's even downright wrong for Christians to be referring to it. And he says this. I want to go on record as strongly disagreeing with that viewpoint strongly disagreeing. Jesus not only referred to the Old Testament to show that it all pointed to him, but it also showed, it also expressed the good news that he came to proclaim and demonstrate. And then Jesus' first disciples did the same, and so should we. We look to the whole word of God when looking for truth from God the whole word of God to understand who God is and how much he loves us to understand how important it is to turn from living a life apart from him to understand how important it is to be forgiven by relying on what Jesus did for us when he took all our sin upon himself receiving the punishment that we deserve upon himself as a substitute so that we could be forgiven and not receive the judgment that we deserve because he received it for us. That is all talked about in both the Old and the New Testaments. The grace of God is talked about in the Old and the New Testaments. The love of God is talked about in the Old and the New Testaments. It's all in this book, and we don't neglect any of it. That's what Peter was teaching. That was the apostles' teaching. That's what the Old Testament introduced. That's what Jesus revealed. But you know what? What I also see, and I don't know if you've ever thought much about this, was the way that they talked about sharing this, the way they talked about being devoted to the apostles' teachings, expressed genuine humility that they needed something taught to them. Now, I marvel... To this day, I marvel at this idea of preaching and teaching the word of God. Here I am standing in front of a bunch of very intelligent people. 
Many of you know your Bibles well, and I'm teaching you, and you're receiving from me. I mean, that's amazing to me. I marvel at the fact that the Bible insists on teaching and preaching being done by flawed people like me to equip God's people. That takes humility. You're expressing humility by receiving it. The people in Acts were receiving hum- or, or expressing humility by receiving it from the apostles. But the fact is, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't walk according to the example we see of one of the teachers of Israel named Samuel, who said, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. That's what Samuel said to the people of Israel. But I also wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't urge you to seek God's truth in your own personal devotional times with God. Not just to receive it at times like these in a corporate sense, but even in a personal sense, spending time with God because God wants to meet with you personally. So that's Receiving God's teaching. Secondly, that word fellowship is translated from the Greek word koinonia. Devoted to fellowship. Devoted to sharing life together. Koinonia is all about sharing life together. In fact, there's an associated word, koinonikos, which is the Greek word for generous. So koinonia means fellowship, koinonikos means generous. Our fellowship together is meant to be an expression of generosity. And that's what we saw in the early church in this passage we just read. They were selling things and giving things away to people in need. Writer, pastor, and theologian John Stott says, Christian fellowship is Christian caring, and Christian caring is Christian sharing. We can see from these earliest descriptions of the church that people from all nations and all economic backgrounds, were, they were all lovingly accepted as part of the early church. No one felt excluded, and that's what makes it so meaningful that they sold things to share what they had with those in need. They didn't look down on those in need. They helped those in need. But we have to remember this was voluntary. It wasn't like a, a commune where everybody had to sell everything. They had to empty their bank account and give it to the church. They didn't do that. This was voluntary. I mean, it's obvious they still had homes to meet in, right? They, it talks about the fact that they had homes that they were meeting in. So it's not like they sold everything and gave it all away. But as people had need, people were selling things to help those in need. This is why I believe that having the church gather in small groups, meeting in homes the way the early church did, is so valuable. You know, this past November, i got to apologize. This past November, we, we did a sermon series on small groups. And I had sign-up sheets for small groups. And people signed up for small groups. There, we've got about 40-plus adults who want to be in small groups. And I haven't gotten back to you. That was a long time ago. That's because after November came December, and you know, starting small groups around Christmas time seems a little awkward. People have very unique schedules around Christmas time. Well, then it was January, and we were into prayer and fasting. And I thought, I don't want to get people into small groups when we're trying to have all these corporate prayer meetings in January. So maybe after the prayer and fasting. Well, now it's February. Well, I better get going, (laughs) because it'll be summer all of a sudden. But... There is value in being a part of small groups because we're more aware of how we can care for one another, more aware of how we can love each other. And it's more easy to invite people to become part of the church. It's more easy, it's it's easier to help people. You know, this past January, we made an announcement. Jeannie, who is over over there, hi Jeannie, give us a wave. Jeannie came up and shared a testimony. Jeannie is an asylum seeker. She's not a refugee. She's not a a landed immigrant. She's an asylum seeker, and she shared about that from the front. Basically, she has no status in Canada. And so she was eventually able to get a work permit, but eventually she needed to find her own place to live because a a distant relative couldn't look after her anymore. So she had to move out of that distant relative's home. And so we talked about having a shower for Jeannie, a shower because she had literally nothing to furnish an apartment with, not a thing, not even a towel let alone furniture and a bed and whatever. And 
So we announced that there'd be a shower at the end of January. Well, there hasn't been a shower. Why not? Well, because koinonia happened. Koinonia happened. And koinonia, what was that other word, that other Greek word? Koinonika happened. After that, she had shared her testimony, a family in the church came up to her and said, Jeannie, this was Terry and Patty. God bless you, Terry and Patty. They took her under her roof. They had a suite in the basement. Let's, let's be real. It was, it was a little bit self-serving because Misha lives there and Misha loves Jeannie. And Misha loved sharing space with her. They're good friends. And so they get to love on each other and be good friends. Terry. Yeah, it was more self-serving than that because we've got somebody who's so cheerful and so loving and so full of Jesus that uh, the blessing's coming this way. That's fantastic. Yeah. Let's give the Lord a clap offering for that one. Thank you, Lord. You know, this we talk about the fact that the book of Acts doesn't end at the end of the book. Yeah, yeah, the book ends. But the adventure that this book describes does not end. It continues to this day. It's an ongoing adventure. The adventure continues. And it's continuing in the Dirksen household as they care for the body of Christ when a need arose. Thirdly, John Stott sees a pairing up together of the talking of the breaking of bread and speaking of times of prayers as a worshiping church. Clearly, the breaking of bread was as commonly done then as was fellowship and as public teaching. That expression, the breaking of bread, is something the Bible, a phrase that the Bible uses as an expression of the practice that Jesus introduced when he taught his disciples to continue remembering and commemorating his death by sharing bread and wine or bread and juice together as emblems of his body and his blood. We call it communion, which is a word the King James Bible uses to translate the word koinonia when the King James Bible talks about communion, like talking about the sharing of the body and blood of Jesus. It's about sharing in the spiritual realities of our faith, but it's also about it not just Sharing in those spiritual realities of what Jesus did for us, but it's about communing with God, having a relationship with Him now. Communion means we have communion with God, but we do it together because we have communion with each other. And so there's a lot of aspects of it that are very important, but at Gateway East, we don't do it every week, we don't do it every time we meet. We do it one Sunday a month when we have a lunch together, as a part of a meal, as a part of the service when the meal follows. And then being devoted to prayer, it's worth noting that it is a correct translation to put an S at the end of prayer there. It's talking about plural prayers. It talks about the prayers. Why does it say the prayers? Uh, scholars believe that's because Luke was talking about times of prayer, not just praying personally, but times of prayer, corporate times of prayer. That's why when they talk about being devoted to prayers, the prayers, it's clear it was a corporate. He was talking about corporate prayer. Now, I hope you all have a prayer life in your personal life with God, but I would love for Gateway East to have a prayer life that's corporate and to not just be a church that prays, Let's be a praying church. Do you understand the difference? Being a praying church means that's more of a part of our culture than just being a church that prays sometimes. I I don't mind pausing here to say we have two prayer times that I really welcome you at. On Wednesday, on Wednesday mornings, we meet at 7.30 to 8, just a half an hour. You'd be surprised how quickly it's over. Because there's so many things we can pray about. But all we focus on are our five 2024 prayer goals. And those five 24, you can just pray for five or six minutes for each of them. And the half hour is gone. And so please join us. The Zoom link is in your weekly email. And you can pray with us on Wednesday mornings. There's also Wednesday evenings, one Wednesday a month on the first Wednesday of the month, starting in March at our house. If you ever want to see what Pastor Ken and Fiona's house is like, come on over. It's on the first Wednesday of the month. And you're all welcome to join us. So lastly, I just don't want to, I think we'd be amiss if we, we've talked about the four things already that 
Luke described the church being devoted to. But there was one more thing they were devoted to. And that was growth. Evangelism. Sharing about Jesus. Obviously, they must have been. Because it says the Lord was adding to them daily. Daily, they were growing. Clearly, this was a work of God. It couldn't have happened without God drawing people to himself. But it was also involved the obedience of his people. Because the way they lived caused them to have favor with the people around them. And people were added to the church. I hope we have favor with people around us because of the the aroma of Christ. When they see how we live. That's why I believe that as we at Gateway East live in the way Luke described the early church, being devoted to God's teaching, fellowship with other Christians, participating in the corporate remembrance of Christ's sacrifice, and in corporate prayers, then we too will grow. We began this series of the book of Acts talking about the fact that it's the adventure that doesn't end. The book ends, the adventure continues. And I want to invite Tony up. Tony, come on up. We're talking about a growing church. And I just want to invite Tony to share a little bit about what he's going through. His brother Julian is here too. And Julian, you're going to share on another Sunday. Is that okay? Um, I might call you up. It depends how long Tony talks. <laughs> Tony, come on a little closer. How, I, I only have so much cord here. That's part of the problem. Um, when did you start coming to Gateway East? <clears throat> uh, probably when Julian invited me. Uh, and that was probably beginning, or no, end of September, beginning of November. Okay. Now, you, you'd been going through something before you even came that was sort of had your, got your attention. What was going on in your life? I was just really stressed out about my current situation, um, being like self-employed and everything, always looking for that next job, always wondering where the money was going to come in. Um, a lot of, I guess, struggles in my life as well with like being young and everything, maybe not, um, what would be the word, I guess, like thinking I could do it and a lot of people kind of doubting me in that way. So also thinking that correlating with not getting the work that I wanted and stuff like that. So it was really frustrating at the time and uh, it took a big toll on how I felt. So you, had a, you were self-employed, business wasn't going the way you hoped, so finances, self-esteem, you know, all kinds of issues. Yeah. You actually had a bit of a crisis point at one point, didn't you? Yeah, it was, it was really bad. It was really bad. Um, it was it, like I found myself just really upset one day, and it was just really hard to get out of bed sometimes, like just really hard to get moving. So how did Jesus get your attention? Um, Yeah, that's actually quite the story. So I was actually um, in Japan at the time, and I was just really upset about how nothing was going right. Um, One of the people I did work for said something like they they weren't happy with the work, and then one of the people I had working for me also said that they felt like they weren't paid enough, and I and I just and on top of like everybody doubting me and just everything like that. I was like, man, maybe this isn't for me. And um, so I was really upset. And I was honestly, uh, yeah, just watching, you know, drowning myself in social media, trying not to really think about anything. Maybe that's what a lot of us do. I don't know. But um, yeah, I was just drowning myself in social media. And then I just turned the phone off. And it was about four in the morning. And um, I just remembered someone just kind of saying to me, like, this is the last time that you're going to stress about this. This is the last time you're going to feel this way. And I really do believe that that might have been God trying to talk to me. Was that something somebody said to you, or is it something, a thought that went through your mind? It was just like a feeling that, um, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, it was, it was a thought, but at the same time it felt really real, and I didn't understand why I was telling myself that, I guess. So you had a moment in the midst of that crisis where you suddenly had this thought go through your mind or along with the the feeling with it, this is the last time you're going to feel this way. Yeah. Wow. And that's, that's like the Holy Spirit talking to Tony. 
This is the last time. Now, what happened after that? If that was the last time you're supposed to feel that way, what happened next? Um, it really brought up my, I guess, confidence and stuff like that. So um, it really just showed me that everything's going to be okay. So I stopped worrying as much. Um, and now I'm just able to, like, kind of, no matter what happens, I'm just able to wake up and just take the day on as it is because I know that God is telling me not to worry and that he's always with me. Now, how soon before you came to Gateway East did that happen? Like, how much time passed before you finally came to Gateway East after that moment? So I was doing a lot of work out of town. Um, so it was probably about a month after. So about a month after you came to town, your brother Julian's coming to Gateway East. Did he invite you here? He does, yeah. And so what happened when you came to Gateway East? Um, well, you approached me, or I believe Kevin approached David. Me. David, sorry. Um, and yeah, it was just, uh, it felt like a home from there. Right. Now, let me share a little perspective, or, or well, actually, maybe I'll ask about it. You guys are in a small group over there by the wall. Remember, we have, for those of you who have never been a part of Gateway East, if you're new here, we often have small groups after the sermon to talk about uh, stuff that's going, that we talked about. You know, basically, how does this apply to my life? And people talk about it in small groups, sometimes pray together. Well, you guys were in a group over there, and David joined your group, right? Yeah. What did, what did you and David talk about in that group? Um, I believe one of the questions was just about, like, the struggles that you had in your life at that time. Yeah. Um, and we, we voiced our struggles, and we each prayed for each other. Right. Now, that was brand new to you, and yeah. you accepted Jesus as the one who was going to help you, and the one you wanted to live your life for after that. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So Tony was over there while well, you guys are all having your groups over here and over here. Tony's group over there was having a little salvation time. David led Tony to the Lord that morning. That's worth a clap. So I didn't know that until David came up to me afterwards and he told me um, Julian had shared an update with David and Julian, you're going to share that update on another Sunday because the adventure continues. So we want to hear about how you're a part of the adventure. And Tony understood from David that he needed to put his trust in Jesus. I think, was that when you realized it might have been Jesus telling you uh, you're not going to feel this way anymore? Yeah, I think that was that really strongly reinforced what I had thought, like that Jesus was talking to me and saying, don't worry about it, I'm with you. Amen. Well, Jesus is with you, Tony. And thanks for sharing your story. Let's welcome Tony into the church. And thanks. You're good. The adventure continues. People are getting saved. Julian's going to share his story at another date, which I hope you're here for, because his story is also quite extraordinary, how he ended up at Gateway East, do you guys, like, growing up, did you have any church background? Did you go to church? No, they had no church background at all. And yet here they are, Sunday after Sunday, soaking up the worship and the word and getting to know Jesus. So praise the Lord. I'm so thrilled about that. Well, we're going to get into small groups now. And if you need to get saved, you can get saved in your small group. That's sort of a joke, but not really, if you want to get saved. Which one of the following areas of church life do you find most meaningful, personally, I'm talking personally, when done together, and why? Teaching, or fellowship, or worship, or communion, or prayer, or outreach? You notice I've got six things here, after a four-point sermon. So... We've talked about all six of those. Which of those do you find most meaningful when done together for you personally? And why? 